Welcome to Kids Corner. I'm so glad you joined us today. Today we are going to learn from God's Word that nothing you do for Him is ever forgotten, but He has a special reward for everything that you do. It is so wonderful that God has that for us. Eddie, he has something he wants to tell you too. Just one second here. So, uh, Eddie, you had something that you wanted to say to the kids today? Yeah. I see some of you come every week and sing with us. It's so good to have you here. I bet you wish you were out playing, huh? No? You're glad you're here? You love learning the Bible? You love to sing the verses and help us out? Oh, did you know that God has a special reward for you? He remembers everything you do. You know, I'm so glad you love to be here. Because I love being here too. I just love it. I love to learn about the Bible. And I love God. And I love God's people. And I'm just happy to be here. Well, I, I got to go now. But I'm glad you're here too. Okay, see you later. Bye. Love ya. Now, many of the books of the Bible were first written as letters. And our verse today comes from one of those letters. Actually, it was written to a church at Corinth. And the people at Corinth, they were not living like they knew the Lord at all. So Paul, he wrote him a letter and he says, now you need to start doing this and you need to start doing that and this and that. And he wrote the whole letter. And then at the end, he's telling them, now you know what to do, but you're going to have to do it. And so it starts out, therefore, and then he calls them something. He says, therefore, my beloved brethren. Do you have brothers and sisters? Do you know that when you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and he becomes your savior from your sin, that you now have brothers and sisters of those who believe in the Lord Jesus? And so, you know, if I could see you face to face, I would say to you, oh, my beloved little children, I love you. And no, you're not really my children, but because you're part of the body of Christ, we are all related. So he says to them, no, you haven't been doing what you're supposed to be doing, but I still love you. You're still loved. So he says, therefore, my beloved brethren. Can you say that with me? Therefore, my beloved brethren. Very good. Then he says to them, all right, I've told you what to do. But they lived in a city where there were a lot of people that didn't believe in God. And you know, kids, when you're around people that don't believe in God, sometimes you're a little hesitant to do what God has said. Maybe instead of praying for your food at school, even though you know you should, you don't want to because you think someone might laugh at you. But he said to them, I want you to be steadfast. I want you to be bold and do what I have commanded. And he says, I want you to be steadfast, unmovable. Don't just, you know, oh, oh, you're doing that? Oh, well, all right, I'll do it too. No, stand for the Lord, even though you're the only one. So let's try that. It says, therefore, my beloved brethren, can you say it? You say it after me. I'm going to, my hands are like this. You listen. When I snap my fingers, you say what I've just said. Therefore, my beloved brethren. Therefore, my beloved brethren. Be steadfast and movable. Be steadfast and movable. Very good. And then he says, 
you stand for the Lord at all times. And then he says, I want you to abound in something. And abound means just do it a lot. He says, always abounding in the, ooh, the next word is work. You may say, but I don't like to work. God is saying, oh, but there's a certain work I want you to do. I want you to always abound in the work of the Lord. And you may say, but, but I am, I'm not a, a priest and, and I'm, I'm not a missionary and I'm not a Sunday school teacher. How could I abound in the work of the Lord? Do you know that when Jesus left heaven, he came down to this earth to be a servant. Do you know what a servant does? A servant looks around and finds out what is needed and says, here, I'll do it. And so God says, I want you to look around, find out what other people need, and to serve them. Do you know that each one of you have a father? Do you know how much energy and time and effort your father puts into working all day to earn money? And then when he comes home, does he say, oh, well, I'm buying myself a new car, and then I'm getting some new clothes, and then I'm going to go see a, a ball game? No. He says to you, okay, what kind of tennis shoes do you need? Okay, what camp did you want to go to? Oh, did you need some new clothes? Oh, we better pay the rent. Oh, you know, let's put food on the table. He works for you a lot. And so you need to look at him and say, Dad, what can I do to serve you? Can I help you? Can I get you this? Is there anything I can do for you? And your mother works very hard. You know, you need to serve her. Maybe you can fold the clothes, help her set the table, do the dishes, pick up, look after your little brothers and sisters, keep your room neat and nice. God says, I want you to abound in the work of the Lord and serving others is the work of the Lord and especially those that are close to you that serve you all the time. And then he says, all right, I want you to abound in the work of the Lord because there's a reason, and it's a very important reason. He says, because if you know something, you're going to say, oh, I want to do it. And what he says, because, he says, therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Say that, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor, and labor is the same as work, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Do you know what he's saying? He says, I am going to reward you for every single thing you do. Now, kids, we don't get to heaven by doing good works. We get to heaven by believing in the Lord Jesus. But he says that once you believe in him, you are created then anew in Christ Jesus to do good works. And he even says, I've planned out those things for you. Now, you know, he says, your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Do you know that I have some notes I will come across and it'll say, thank you, Mrs. LaPointe, for doing, I don't even remember doing it. What, it's this thing, I don't remember. And then I look down and it's signed by someone. I don't even remember that person. But God says, I remember, I remember everything. And so you need to abound in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Don't waste your time doing things that has no value, that is just going to pass away, that's meaningless. God says, buy back the time. Spend your time serving me. All right, we're going to just do that one more time. It goes, therefore, my beloved brethren, you do it. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable. Be steadfast and movable. Always abounding in the work of the Lord always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord, is not in vain in the Lord. Oh, you did a fabulous job. Now I'm going to show you the motions, and the motions go, therefore, my beloved, oh, he loves them, my beloved brethren. And then you go, 
hips. Take one step forward, be step steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work, like you're, you're digging in the work of the, then you make an L, Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. All right. Can you say and sing that verse? Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. First Corinthians 15:58. That is one of my favorite verses. I love it very much. Try it one more time. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. First Corinthians 15:58. And it's found in 1 Corinthians 15, 58. So you can look it up. And right there in 1 Corinthians 15, 58, it says this very verse. Do it one more time. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast and movable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain. Good job. You know, Alice's mother went to the store and she said to Alice, Alice, I want you to clean up your bedroom. Well, Alice wanted to call her friend. And so she thought, oh, how can I get this done? So she goes in her bedroom and she says, I'm going to stuff everything in the drawer. Well, pretty soon the drawers were full. So she says, I'm going to stuff it in the closet. She stuffs it in the closet. And then, you know, there was more. So she kicks it under the bed. And then she kind of just smooths out her bed. Did Alice do a good job? Do you know, we're going to learn today that we are to do things with faithfulness. And if you're faithful in what you do, you do your best. You do it as unto the Lord. And you know, Alice, she didn't do it as unto the Lord. She just said, I want to get done with this. And God says, I see that and other people see that. Well, now, Eduardo, he wanted to go swimming. But his father said, you must mow the lawn first. So he starts to mow the lawn, and but you know what? He thought, if I cut the corner, it'll take me a whole lot less time. But then he thought, no, no, I should go to the corner. That's the best way to do it, and, and make sure I get everything. Well, then when he got by the flowers, he thought, now, if, 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 I, if I just go a little bit over to the edge, I won't cut off any flowers, and it'll take me a lot less time. And he thought, no, no, I need to do this right. And so he did the whole job right. Now, was he faithful in what he did? Did he do the job to the best of our ability? You know, there's a man in our story today, and in every single thing he did, he did it faithfully as unto the Lord. He was faithful, and we're going to find out if faithfulness pays. Because sometimes when you do the best that you can possibly do, nobody is watching. Sometimes nobody even says thank you. And sometimes there's not anybody that knows except for who. That's right. God knows everything. And he says, you be steadfast. You be immovable. You abound in the work of the Lord because your labor I can guarantee you, is not going to be in vain. And he knows how well you do your labor. And that is how he will reward you. Well, you remember last week that King Belshazzar, he was just taking the cups that were dedicated to the Lord. And he was just 
making toasts to other gods. He says, I don't care that about God. And he was shaking his fist in the face of God, like many people do today, to say, I don't care what the Bible says. You know what? It doesn't matter who you marry. It doesn't matter if you, if you go to church or you watch dirty movies. Or It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I kill whatever I want to. It's my body, you know. And God says, oh, no. I see everything. And Belshazzar had that same attitude. And remember, while he was in there doing and laughing and, and thinking he was having so much fun, that the Medes and the Persians, they blocked up the Euphrates River. They were able then to go in under the city wall. And that very night, he was killed. But from history, we know that very few people were killed. The Medes and the Persians conquered the great city of Babylon with very little bloodshed. In fact, King Darius, he was a very brilliant leader because he realized he had this huge kingdom that he needed to rule. And he knew he could not do it himself. And so to make everything run as smoothly as possible, he looked around and he found all of the men of the city that had been trained, that were very brilliant, that knew the government. And the Bible tells us that he took 120 of them. It was a huge area that Babylon ruled. And of those 120 men, he says, I want you to rule the kingdom. Now you go over here and, and you make sure everything's going over there, right? And, and you go out to this area and, and he assigned everybody to a certain spot. And they had been trained by Babylon and they were very good leaders. And by him putting them in these important positions, he regained and retained their loyalty. Well, then, as he was watching these 120, why, he said, you know what? There's three that I see are just way above everyone else in their abilities and their leadership. And so he says, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take those three and I'm going to put them over everyone else. And guess who was one of the three? Yes, it was Daniel. He was chosen as one of the three. And then, as the king noticed everyone doing their responsibilities, even of those three, there was one that stood out from all the others. And when he looked at that one, he thought, oh, he is such a good governor. Oh, he is so great. I'm going to put him next in line. You know what Daniel did three times a day? This is going to tell you what made him so wise, to always know the right thing to do. The Bible says that three times a day he prayed to God. Can you imagine how busy he was being in charge of everyone? And yet, every morning when he got up, he said, Oh, Lord, I cannot do it without you. You give me your wisdom. You give me your spirit. And then at lunch, instead of going to the power lunches and, and you know, getting in good with other people, and, and he said, No, I've got to go home and pray to God. He's the one I need to talk to. And then at night, instead of all those banquets and parties, Daniel, he went home and he prayed to the Lord. Kids, no wonder he was above everyone. You know, he was steadfast, immovable. He was so faithful. He did everything. And if you spend that much time with the Lord, do you know what you're going to be? You're going to be steadfast. You're going to say, my face is seeing God right now. I'm not going to do that because I know it's not right. And you know what, kids? You'll be faithful to say, I'm going to do everything for the Lord. And that was Daniel. And God wants you to be steadfast and faithful to him like Daniel was. Well, when? The king was going to promote Daniel over everyone else. 
How do you think these others felt? What do you think their first thoughts were? Did you guess jealousy? They were very jealous. You know what, kids? You will be jealous too. Every single one of us will be jealous. Jealousy is something that we all have, and usually we're jealous of someone that does the same thing that we do. But you know what, kids? When you're jealous, there are some things you need to do because jealousy is very destructive to you and to others. And so what you need to do is you need to think about what you have and thank God because people are jealous because they want something that someone else has. Do you know what? I should have gotten that part in the play or you know what? I would make a better class president or you know what? I wish I would have made those baskets and, and been the star player. But kids, you need to not think about what somebody else has that you don't have. You need to think about what you have and thank God. And you can't just say, oh, thank you for everything. No, you have to list the items. You need to say, Lord, thank you that I wake up in safety every morning. There's people around the world and they don't know if they're going to wake up safe the next morning. You need to say, Lord, thank you that I have a house to live in. There are people that live in streets. They have no houses. In one country, in Afghanistan, they were digging holes in the ground and putting newspapers on top of it just to keep themselves out of the cold. Do you have food on the table? Do you have clothes to wear? Do you have a school to go to? Do you have someone that loves you? Think about what you have and thank God. God. Can you say that with me? Think about what you have and thank God. Then if you are jealous and you will be so when you are jealous, you need to replace selfish lies with God's truth. Now kids, do you want to believe a selfish lie? We don't want to believe a lie, let alone a selfish lie, and yet we believe the selfish lies. And the selfish lies that people believe when they are jealous is, oh, I deserve that. Oh, you know what? Some of their selfish lies is, well, it's not fair that you have it, and I don't. Oh, you know what? I can't be happy until I get it. Or people will notice you more if you have it. Those are lies. And they're selfish. Every single thing you need pertaining unto life and godliness, God will give you. And if you don't get something, even maybe you don't get something, and it's not fair that you didn't get it, God is saying to you, do you know what? If you got that, it would just be a waste of time. You'd be spending your time doing things that I never intended for you to do. Maybe it's a part in a play. Do you know how many hours you have to practice when you've got a part in the play? Maybe it's to be an officer in the class. Do you know how many hours it takes for that? Maybe to be a cheerleader, all that time cheering or maybe being part of a team. God says, no, I don't want you to do that. It's a waste of time for you. So if you are jealous, the first thing you do, say it with, with me, Think about what you have and thank God. And then it is replace selfish lies with God's truth. And God's truth is, I will give it to you if it's meant for you. You don't have to think, oh, if I'd have just been there or I'd have just done this, I could have done that. No, God will give you that. And then there's one last thing. If you really want to break jealousy in your heart, then just show kindness to the one who has what you want. Show them kindness. Maybe someone makes a great play on the team. Then say, that was a great play. Maybe they get good grades at school, good job, whatever, had a part in the play you wanted, you did great. Say kind words to them and show them kindness. So what are you to do? You're to think about what you have and thank God. Then replace those selfish lies with God's truth. And then say something nice to the one who has what you want. Do you know what? 
these men here did not follow those steps. First of all, they needed to think about what they had. They were leaders. They had great positions. There was no reason for them to be jealous of Daniel. They had been chosen for their abilities, but they couldn't think about that. They could only think about the fact that he had something that they didn't have. And then they believe selfish lies. We should have it. Did they spend every morning, noon, and night praying? You know what, kids? If you're not going to spend time with God and pray and ask Him for wisdom, He may not give you the wisdom that He gives somebody else. But you've got to spend the time. They, they, their selfish lies was, we deserve it. They didn't deserve it. And then, of course, to show kindness, they, as we are going to see, was only not going to show kindness. They were going to try and destroy Daniel. And so they got together. So the Bible tells us that because the king was going to promote Daniel, that the governors and the satraps, they sought to find some charge against Daniel. Certainly, there was some area that he had not been faithful in. And so, they must have investigated people that had worked for him. They would go, surely, surely you know someone or something that he's done that wasn't right. And everybody would say, no, 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 everything he did was right. Well, come on, now you worked for Daniel. I'm sure something happened that, that, that wasn't right. No, everything was all right. Okay, well, okay. Some, somebody out there knows something. And you know what? Because Daniel had been faithful in everything. He didn't just say, oh, I don't have time for that, or I'm not going to do my best, or, or he, he didn't even forget about things. And he was faithful in all he did. And so they couldn't find anything. There was no charge, no fault, nothing in all those years that Daniel had done wrong because he was faithful. He did everything as unto the Lord. But they says, well, we shall not find any charge against Daniel unless we find it against him concerning his God. Now, you know, the only thing was, there was no law against praying to another God. In that time, you could pray to any God you wanted to pray to. And so they thought, oh, come on, we've got to think of something. What is something we could think of, a law that we could have, that we could get Daniel? And they thought and they thought, and I'm sure they must have discussed it for a very long time. And finally, one of them says, I've got it. This will surely work. And they all agreed. And so they went to the king with their plan. <coughs> So the Bible tells us that all the governors and the important men, they thronged the king. They all went in there together. And you know, they said to the king, oh, King Darius. Now, King Darius had only ruled for two years at this point. But they must have said to him, oh, king, you know, we've been under, under other rulers, and you are the best. We say nobody is great as you are. And so we have this plan. We're thinking that in honor of you, that, you know, we ought to have a decree. And uh, it ought to say that for 30 days, one month, no one can bow down to any god or any man except you, O oh king. They cannot pray to anyone else except you. And the king, I'm sure this took him by surprise. What? You think I'm that great? Oh, well, I never realized it. Oh, yes, we do, king. Now, kids, they weren't telling the truth. That wasn't the reason they wanted to make the law, because they thought the king was so great. He didn't know the true intent of their hearts. And so he says, well, if, if, if you think that that's a good idea. And then they said, yes, we do, and we want to make sure everyone does it. And if they don't, let's see, what could we, oh, yes. Why don't you have them 
cast into the den of lions if they don't for 30 days pray only to you and no one else. And so the king, he must have thought, okay, oh, sounds good. Well, wow. And so he signed that decree into law. And in the Medes and the Persians, when there was a law, even the king couldn't change it. It became the law of the land. Well, you know, the Bible tells us that the word spread about this decree. And while Daniel was at work that morning, probably in the office, he heard about it. He heard that no one could pray to anyone except Darius for 30 days. Now, uh, it came noontime. What do you think Daniel was going to do? So Daniel came home according to his custom, and he went into his house. Now, you know, kids, when you pray, uh, does it matter where you are when you pray? Can you pray anywhere? Would it be just as easy for Daniel to pray in another room? instead of right before the window where people could see him? Doesn't God hear you wherever you are? Yes, they do. But you know what? Daniel, he says, my reputation doesn't matter. It's about God. It doesn't matter that I live a couple more years. He says, you know what? I'm going to be steadfast. I'm going to be immovable. I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to do what is right. I'm not going to let their decree sway me from doing what I know God wants me to do. And at this point, he knew they were trying to catch him. He knew probably who had made this decree and why they had made it. And so he says, I'm going to show them that I am going to follow God even in the midst of danger. You know what, kids? You need to follow God even in the midst of danger. Maybe you want to pray over your meal at school, but you're afraid the kids will laugh at you. Maybe when your teacher makes fun of God, you want to raise your hand and say, you know, I believe in the Lord. Maybe you're the only one in your family that goes to church, and you have to stand alone, and you have to make that decision, am I going to do it? or not. Well, the Bible tells us that Daniel, he went over to his window. Now, kids, he always prayed in front of the window because the window faced Jerusalem. And in Jerusalem was the temple where God's presence was. And so he went over to the, to the window. Now, kids, could he have prayed with his eyes open, just saying, I'm still praying and, and not look like it? Yes, he could have, and God would have heard him. But Daniel knew why they had made the law, and he says, I'm going to be faithful. I'm going to be immovable. I'm going to abound in the work of the Lord. And he says, I don't care. And so he bowed down right then, and by that open window, he prayed, and he began to talk to his God. Now, you know, after the men had signed this thing with Darius, some of them, they went running over, and they said, oh, quick, let's get over to Daniel's house. It's almost noon. So they got over to Daniel's house, and, and then they kind of hid behind some shrubs or something. I'm not sure what they did, but they were right there, and they said, okay, let's wait for Daniel. And, oh, here he comes. Here he comes from lunch. He's coming now. And so Daniel came in, and maybe they waited, and they saw him pass by the window and walk by it several times. Kids, do you think Daniel was afraid? I think he was. Do you know that courage is doing something even though you are afraid? Just because you're afraid doesn't mean you don't have courage. And so he bowed down and he prayed, and, and the men were watching, and, and they saw him, and they thought, okay, what's he going to do now? And then they saw him go down on his knees, and then they saw him fold his hands and look up to heaven. 
and they knew what he was doing, and that's what they had been waiting for. And so quickly they left. In fact, you can't see it, but right there they are. They're peeking in on Daniel right there, and they ran off to King Darius because they had caught Daniel, just what they had been planning to do. So the men, they quickly ran to King Darius and oh they were so excited and they said to King da Darius uh, oh king um you know that decree that you signed just this morning and the king says yes of course i remember he says you you were the ones who talked me into it and they says well we want you to know that somebody in your kingdom has just ignored it and they have just said we're not going to follow it and you know what? It is just some Jew, you know, some, some foreigner there, and, and he's just decided he's not going to do it, and his name is Daniel. <gasps> Daniel, the Bible says that the king, when he heard that it was Daniel, he was greatly displeased with himself. He thought, why did I sign that? Why did I let my foolish pride make such a decision? I should never have done that. Of course Daniel's going to pray to his God. His God is who gives him wisdom. He's always faithful to his God. He serves him continually. And oh, the Bible tells us that that king set his heart to deliver Daniel. He said, there must be a way. And he says, God and all his lawyers probably and everybody that would know the law. And he said, well, maybe I can make another law. No, king, that won't work. Well, maybe I can pardon him myself. I am the king, you know. No, king, that would be against the law. Well, was there ever another case like this that, that we could maybe get him out of this? No, king. No other case. No, he has to be killed. And you know, the king, he felt so terrible. And the Bible tells him that that evening, the men came to him again and said, you must give the command, O king. Now, you know, in their kingdom, and you did something wrong, you didn't go to jail for three years and then have a trial, and then maybe there were another five years before you got sentenced. If you broke the law, you paid that very day. So the king had no choice but to send his soldiers over to Daniel's house. Well, you know what? Daniel knew the law. Daniel knew that they would be coming. Daniel, I am sure, was just saying, oh, Lord, give me the strength to be steadfast, immovable, to, to stand up for you, to do what's right, to be faithful in everything that I do. And these soldiers took Daniel over to the lion's den. <coughs> So remember when King Nebuchadnezzar was standing outside the fiery furnace? He had gone because he wanted to see them sizzle and burn. But King Darius, he came down there for a totally different reason to the lion's den. Daniel was there, and oh, he says, Daniel, I feel so bad. I tried to save you, but I couldn't. And then, as a testimony to Daniel standing for the Lord, the king said to him, Daniel, your God, whom you serve continually, I know how you serve him all the time, Daniel. Everybody in our kingdom knows how you serve him. He will deliver you. Oh, the king was hoping, and he had no choice, though. He had to give the command, and the command was then that Daniel was thrown down into the den of the lions. Now, you know, kids, what do you think Daniel did when he first got in there? I'm sure he prayed and just says, Oh, Lord, I don't know what's going to happen, but I'm going to trust you. But King Darius, he went back to his palace. So King Darius went back to the palace, 
And they had this very delicious dinner for him. But he says, I don't want anything. And they said, oh, well, let's have some music and some dancing and some entertainment to take your mind off of this. He said, no, no, I don't want any of that. So the Bible tells us that King Darius went to bed that night. Well, he went to bed, but he could not sleep. And he just laid there all night, and he was just waiting for the morning dawn to come and just thinking, what's going to happen to Daniel? And I'm sure as he laid there, he began to think, you know what? This is very strange. Those men came in, and they made me sign that. You know what? They told me how great I was. They didn't mean that at all. They just wanted to get back at Daniel. Have you ever felt that someone used you just for their own purposes? That's how the king was feeling. And I want to tell you, when you feel like someone has used you, you are not happy about it. And all he could think about was they were probably jealous, and, and Daniel had been his most faithful servant. And so the Bible tells us that as soon as morning light came that he got up and he spent the night with no musicians fasting and his sleep went from him. He got up very early in the morning and he went in haste to the den of lions. Maybe he got his chariot out as fast as he could. Give me, give me. I got to get there. I got to get there. And so he went to the den of lions. What do you think he was going to find? <coughs> so the king got to the den of lions. And you know, kids, it was kind of a den where, where you, you, you could s go see down. And, and you know, when you, when you look down into a dark hole, you really can't see until your eyes adjust. And so the Bible says that the king, he, he went and he came to the den and he cried out with a lamenting voice, oh, with much pain in his voice, the king spoke. He says, Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, ha has your God, whom you serve continually, has he been able to deliver you from the lions? <sighs> and then he listened. And the Bible says that he heard a voice. And the voice says, oh, king, live forever. <gasps> it was Daniel, Daniel. And Daniel went on to say, my God, he sent his angel. Daniel wasn't down there by himself. Can you imagine all night long there was an angel and he was talking to the angel and the angel just shut the mouth of the lions and he says, O oh, king, they have not hurt me because I am innocent. I have done, done no wrong against you at all. And so the king, oh, he was so overjoyed. He said, get him out of there. Get him out of there. And so they pulled up Daniel out of the lion's den. And they looked at him. And you know what, kids? Just because the mouth of the lions was shut, it, they could have been scratches from the claws, but there was not a mark found on him. And the king, though, he had had all night to think about it. And so he says, oh, Daniel, I'm so glad you're safe, but I want you to call every single one of those guys that was in on the plot to, to destroy Daniel. And they called them all. And kids, in those days, if the fathers did something wrong, they would take the women and their children. And he says, take them and you throw them into the lion's den. Well, kids, just to show you what a great miracle it was that Daniel was saved out of the lion's den. When they threw those people into the den, the lions jumped up. And before they even hit the ground, the Bible says that the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones to pieces. I only have three lions here. There must have been a whole bunch of lions down there. And those lions were kept very hungry for such a time as this. God did a mighty work in delivering Daniel 
from the den of lions because he had put his faith in him. He was steadfast, immovable. He was abounding in the work of the Lord, and God repaid him. Oh, we ask the question, does faithfulness pay? Yes, it does. And you know, kids, if you pray at school and you're faithful to the Lord, maybe some other kids will say, I think I need to pray too. Maybe if you mention about God and say, oh, I believe in God in your class, maybe you'll give the strength to others to say, I believe too. And if you keep going to church, there's a good chance maybe somebody from your family will go to church with you. Well, you know, the king went back to his palace and he did one last thing. So you know that decree that King Darius made about praying to him, he said, I'm going to have none of that anymore. He went back to his palace and he says, this time I'm going to make a decree. And he, on this decree, it says to all people of all nations and languages that dwell in all of the earth. It's for everybody. And he says, I'm going to make a decree that in my dominion, people must tremble not laugh in the face of. They must tremble before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God, and he is steadfast forever, and his kingdom is the one that will not be destroyed, but it will endure to the end of time and past time. And it says he delivers, he rescues, he works signs, he works wonders, both in heaven and on this earth, because he delivered Daniel from the lion's den, and I saw it, and it was a miracle. He made that decree for his whole kingdom. Well, you know what? God has made a decree too. He says, I have made heaven, and it's a beautiful, wonderful place, and I created and made you to live in heaven. That is my plan for you. But you know, the Bible says that we have all turned our backs on the Lord. We have all said, I don't want to follow him. I want to go my own way, do my own thing. And God has decreed that only those who love him and follow him will live in heaven. And the Bible says that the punishment for sin is death is to be separated from God. And so God says, but I love you. I, I created and made you to live in heaven. I don't want you to perish. And so he sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who shed his blood, died on the cross, paid the punishment for our sin. And God says, if you'll just put your faith and trust in him and say, oh, Lord Jesus, I've sinned. I believe you died on that cross for me. Come and live inside of me. Then he will make you clean and pure and white so you can live in heaven. You know, there's a verse you all know, and it goes that for God who lives in heaven, he so loved the world, even though they were lost in their sin, that who Ever, whoever, the sinful ones, whoever put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He gave, the Lord Jesus Christ came down to die. Whoever believes in him should not perish in their sin, but their sins should be forgiven and they will have everlasting life in heaven with him someday. You know, I pray that you have put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you have told him that you believe in him. You know that he died on that cross. You want him to take your sin away. And you know, once you have asked him to come in and take your sin away, then he says, I want you to abound in the work of the Lord and to serve me faithfully and lay up in heaven great treasure. Would you do that? If you've never put your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, do that now and then abound in the work of the Lord and be faithful in all you do. Do it heartily as unto the Lord. He loves you. He has such a wonderful plan for you. I'm so glad you joined us today. It is so wonderful to hear about someone who stood for the Lord so we can say we're going to stand for the Lord too. I hope you made that decision in your heart. Okay, I love you. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Okay, <laughs>